I bring to you our next installment of Tale of Despero, our read aloud. So we left off chapter seven, which shockingly was actually not that much reading and we got through seven chapters. The chapters are very short, I have to say. I think my lighting is being weird. I apologize. Our light is a little odd and we need to switch out some of the bulbs, but they're very hard to reach. They're quite high up there. Okay, anyways. Uh, we left off with Despero going and listening to music with the king and princess, and his brother sees him, which is breaking one of the sacred mouse rules that you would never reveal yourself to a human, and he breaks an even more sacred mouse rule than that, which was speaking to a human. How dare he? So, and apparently also the king and princess have an interesting history with rodents, particularly rats. We don't know what that is yet. Hmm. We will find out. Okay, chapter eight, to the rats. Oh, I almost forgot, I'm sorry. Uh, and then his father was summoning a meeting for the mouse council by banging on a drum with his tail. Um, boom, tat, tat, if I remember correctly. Uh, so who knows what's gonna happen there, but it, it can't be anything good. So here we go. Doop doo, we are about to go to the rats. Sorry, I'm trying to see if I can get at all better lighting in here. Well, hopefully that's doing something. Okay, chapter eight, to the rats. The mouse council, 13 honored mice and one most very honored head mouse, heeded the call of Lester's drum and gathered in a small secret hole off King Philip's throne room. The 14 mice sat around a piece of wood balanced on spools of thread and listened in horror while Despero's father related the story of what Furlough, the brother, had seen. At the foot of the king, said Lester. Her finger on top of his head, said Lester. He was looking up at her and it wasn't in fear. The mouse council members listened with their mouths open. They listened with their whiskers drooping and their ears flat against their heads. They listened in dismay and outrage and fear. When Lester finished, there was a silence, dismal and deep. Something, intoned the most very honored head mouse, is wrong with your son. He is not well. This goes beyond his fevers, beyond his large ears and his lack of growth. He is deeply disturbed. His behavior endangers us all. Humans cannot be trusted. We know this to be an indisputable fact. A mouse who consorts with humans, a mouse who would sit right at the foot of a man, a mouse who would allow a human to touch him, and here the entire mouse council indulged in a collective shiver of disgust, cannot be trusted. That is the way of the world. Our world. Fellow mice, it is my most hope, my, it is my most fervent hope that Despero has not spoken to these humans, but obviously we can assume nothing. And this is a time to act, not wonder. Lester nodded his head in agreement, and the twelve other members of the mouse council nodded their heads too. We have no choice, said the head mouse. He must go to the dungeon. He pounded his fisted paw on the table. He must go to the rats, immediately. Members of the council, I will now ask you to vote. Those in favor of Despero being sent to the dungeon, say aye. There was a chorus of sad eyes. Those opposed, say nay. Silence reigned in the room. The only noise came from Lester. He was crying. And 13 mice, ashamed for Lester, looked away. Reader, you can imagine your own father not, um, can you imagine your own father not voting against yours being sent to a dungeon full of rats? Can you imagine him not saying one word in your defense? Despero's father wept, and the most very honored head mouse beat his paw against the table again and said, Despero Tilling will appear before the mouse community. He will hear of his sins. He will be given a chance to deny them. If he does not deny them, he will be allowed to renounce them, so that he may go to the dungeon with a pure heart. Despero Tilling is hereby called to sit with the mouse council. At least Lester had the decency to weep at this act of perfidy. Uh, perfidy. Per per blah, blah, blah. It means, like, wickedness. Reader, do you know what perfidy means? I have a feeling you do, based on the scene that has just unfolded here. But you should look up the word in your dictionary, just to be sure. Well, whoops, I ruined that one. But you can also look it up. Uh, it is spelled P-E-R-F-I-D-Y. So there you go, if you want to do that. All right, chapter nine. The right question. 
The Mouse Council sent Furlow to collect Despero, and Furlow found his brother in the library, standing on top of the great open book, his tail wrapped tightly around his feet, and his small body shivering. Despero was reading the story out loud to himself. He was reading from the beginning so that he could get to the end, where the reader was assured that the knight and the fair maiden lived together happily ever after. Despero wanted to read those words, happily ever after. He needed to say them aloud. He needed some assurance that this feeling he had for Princess P, this love, would come to a good end. And so he was reading the story as if it were a spell, and the words of it, spoken aloud, could make the magic happen. See here, said Furlow out loud to himself. He looked at his brother and then looked away. This is just the kind of thing I'm talking about. This is exactly the kind of thing. What's he doing here, for Christ's sake? He's not eating the paper. He's talking to the paper. It's wrong. 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 Hey, he said to Despero. Despero kept reading. Hey, shouted Furlow. Despero, the Mouse Council wants you. Pardon? said Despero. He looked up from the book. The Mouse Council called you to sit with him. Me, said Despero. You. Well, I'm busy right now, said Despero, and he bent his head again to the open book. Furlow sighed. Jeez, he said. Cripes! Nothing makes sense to this guy. Nothing. I was right to turn him in. He's sick. Furlow crawled up the chair leg and then hopped onto the book. He sat next to Despero, and he tapped him on the head once, twice. Hey, he said. The Mouse Council isn't asking. They're telling. They're commanding. You have to come with me right now. Despero turned to Furlow. Do you know what love is? Huh? Love. Furlow shook his head. You're asking the wrong question, he said. The question you should be asking is why the Mouse Council wants to see you. There's someone who loves me, said Despero, and I love her. And that is the only thing that matters to me. Someone who loves you? Someone who loves you? What difference does that make? What matters is that you're in a lot of trouble with the Mouse Council. Her name, said Despero, is Princess P. What? The person who loves me. Her name is P. Cripes, said Furlow. You're missing the whole point of everything here. You're missing the point of being a mouse. You're missing the point of being called to sit with the Mouse Council. You've got to come with me. It's the law you've been called. Despero sighed. He reached out and touched the words fair maiden in the book. He traced them with one paw, and then he put his paw to his mouth. Cripes, said Furlow. You're making a fool of yourself. Let's go. I honor you, whispered Despero. I honor you. Then, reader, he followed Furlow over the book and down the chair leg across the library floor to the waiting mouse council. He allowed his brother to lead him to his fate. Chapter 10. Good Reasons. The entire mouse community, as instructed by the very most honored head mouse, had gathered behind one wall of the castle ballroom. The members of the Mouse Council sat atop three bricks high, piled high, and spread out before them was every mouse, old and young, foolish and wise, who lived in the castle. They were all waiting for Despero. Make way, said Furlow. Here he is. I've got him. Make way. Furlow pushed through the crowd of mice, and Despero clung to his brother's tail. There he is, the mice whispered. There he is. He's so small. They say he was born with his eyes open. Some of the mice pulled away from Despero in disgust, and others, thrill-seekers, reached out to touch him with a whisker or a paw. The princess put a finger on him. They say he sat at the foot of the king. It's simply not done, came the distinctive voice of Despero's Aunt Florence. Make way, make way, shouted Furlow. I have him right here. I have Despero Tilling, who has been called to sit with the Mouse Council. He led Despero to the front of the room. Honored members of the Mouse Council, shouted Furlow. I have brought you Despero Tilling as you requested to sit with you. He looked over his shoulder at Despero. Let go of me, Furlow said. Despero dropped Furlow's tail. He looked up at the members of the Mouse Council. His father met his gaze and then shook his head and looked away. Despero turned and faced the sea of mice. To the dungeon, a voice cried out. Straight to the dungeon with him. Despero's head, which had been full of such delightful phrases as happily ever after and lovely ears and I honor you, suddenly cleared. Straight to the dungeon, another voice shouted. Enough, said the most very honored head mouse. This trial will be conducted in an orderly fashion. We will act civilized and he cleared his throat. He said to Despero, Son, turn and look at me. Despero turned. He looked up into the head mouse's eyes. They were dark eyes, deep and sad and frightened. And looking into them, Despero's heart thudded once, twice. Despero Tilling, said the head mouse. Yes, sir, said Despero. We, the 14 members of the mouse council, have discussed your behavior. First, we will give you a chance to defend yourself against these rumors of your egregious acts. Did you or did you not sit at the foot of a human king? I did, said Despero. But I was listening to the music, sir. There was a song to hear that the king was singing. To hear the what? The song, sir. He was singing a song about the deep purple falling over sleepy garden walls. The head mouse shook his head. Whatever are you talking about is beside the point. The question is this and only this. 
Did you sit at the foot of a human king? Oh, I did, sir. The community of mice shifted their tails and paws and whiskers, and they waited. And did you allow the girl human, the princess, to touch you? Her name is P. Never mind her name. Did you allow her to touch you? Yes, sir, said Despero. I let her touch me. It felt very good. A gasp arose from the assembled mice. Despero heard his mother's voice. Mon Dieu, it is the end of the world. It was a touch. What of it? It is simply not done, came Aunt Florence's voice from the crowd. To the dungeon, said a mouse in the front row. Silence, roared the most very honored head mouse. Silence. He looked down at Despero. Do you, Despero Tilling, understand the sacred, never-to-be-broken rules of conduct for being a mouse? Yes, sir, said Despero. I guess so, but did you break them? Yes, sir, said Despero. He raised his voice. But I broke the rules for good reasons, because of music and because of love. Love, said the head mouse. Oh, cripes, said Furlough. Here we go. I love her, sir, said Despero. We are not here to talk about love. This trial is not about love. This trial is about you being a mouse, shouted the most very honored head mouse from high atop the bricks, and not acting like one. Yes, sir, said Despero. I know. No, I don't think you know that you do know. And because you do not deny the charges, you must be punished. You are to be sent as ancient castle mouse law decrees to the dungeon. You are being sent to the rats. That's right, shouted Mouse in the crowd. That's the ticket. The dungeon. The rats? Despero's small heart sank all the way to the tip of his tail. There would be no light in the dungeon, no stained glass windows, no library, no books, and there would be no Princess P. But first, said the most very honored head mouse, we will give you the chance to renounce your actions. We will allow you to go to the dungeon with a pure heart. Renounce. Repent. Say that you are sorry that you sat at the foot of a human king. Say that you are sorry you allowed the human princess to touch you. Say that you regret these actions. Despero felt hot, and then cold, and then hot again. Renounce her. Renounce the princess. Mon dieu, shouted his mother. Son, do not act in this le fool. Renounce, repent. What say you, Despero Tilling? I say... I say... I say, no, whispered Despero. What? said the head mouse. No, said Despero. And this time he did not whisper the word. I am not sorry. I will not renounce my actions. I love her. I love the princess. There was a bellow of collective outrage. The whole of the mouse community surged towards Despero. The mice seemed to be one angry body with hundreds of tails and thousands of whiskers and one huge hungry mouth opening and closing, opening and closing, saying over and over again, to the dungeon, to the dungeon, to the dungeon. The words pounded through Despero's body with each beat of his heart. Very well, said the most very honored head mouse. You will die then with a black heart. Threadmaster, he called. Bring out the thread. Despero marveled at his own bravery. He admired his own defiance. And then, reader, he fainted. <laughs> uh, we'll do one more. Chapter 11. The Threadmaster Cometh. When Despero came to, he heard the drum. His father was beating a rhythm that was much more boom and much less tat than before. Together, Lester and the drum produced ominous sound that was something like this. Boom, 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 tat. Boom, 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 tat. Make way for the thread, cried a mouse, who was pushing a spool of red thread through the crowd. Make way for the thread. Boom, 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 tat, went the drum. To the dungeon, shouted the mice. Despero lay on his black, Despero lay on his back, blinking his eyes. How, he wondered, had things gone so terribly wrong? Wasn't it a good thing to love? In the story in the book, love was a very good thing. Because the knight loved the fair maiden, he was able to rescue her, and they lived happily ever after. It said so. In the book. They were the last words on the page, happily ever after. Despero was certain that he had read those exact words time and time again. Lying on the floor with the drum beating and the mice shouting and the threadmaster calling out, Make way, make way! Despero had a sudden chilling thought. Had some other mouse eaten the words that spoke the truth? Did the knight and the fair maiden really not live happily ever after? Reader, do you believe there is such a thing as happily ever after? Or, like Despero, have you too begun to question the possibility of happy endings? Happily ever after, whispered Despero. Happily ever after, he said again as the spool of thread came to a stop beside him. The thread, the thread, the thread, murmured the mice. 
I'm sorry, said the mouse behind the spool, but I have to ask you to stand up. I have to do my job. Despero got slowly to his feet. On your hind legs, please, said the Threadmaster. It's the rules. Despero stood on his hind legs. Thank you, said the mouse. I appreciate it. While Despero watched, the Threadmaster unwound a length of red thread from the spool and tied a loop. Just enough for the neck, muttered the mouse. No more, no less. That's what the last Threadmaster taught me. Enough thread for the neck. He looked up at Despero and then back down at the loop of thread. And you, my friend, have a small neck. The Threadmaster raised his arms and put them around Despero's neck. He leaned in close, and Despero smelled celery. He could feel the Threadmaster's breath in his ear as he worked at tightening the thread. Is she beautiful? The Threadmaster whispered. What? said Despero. Shh! The princess. Is she beautiful? The princess bee? Yes. She's lovely beyond all imagining, said Despero. Just right, said the Threadmaster, and he drew back. He nodded his head. A lovely princess. Just so. Like a fairy tale. And you love her, as a knight loves a maiden. You love her with a courtly love. A love that's based on bravery and courtesy and honor and devotion. Just so. How do you know that? Despero said. How do you know about fairy tales? Shh! The mouse leaned in close, and Despero smelled celery again. Be brave, my friend, whispered the Threadmaster. Be brave for the princess. And then he stepped back, turned, and shouted, Hello, mice! The thread has been tied. The thread has been knotted. A roar of approval went up from the crowd. Despero squared his shoulders. He had made a decision. He would do as the Threadmaster had suggested. He would be brave for the princess. Even if, reader, could it be true, there was no such thing as happily ever after. Mm. We're at 16 and a half minutes, and the next one is quite short. Okay, we'll do one more. I'm sorry, we're going through 12. <laughs> I, I, I was not entirely correct earlier. Because why not? We can't leave it on that much of a cliffhanger. We should leave it on more of a cliffhanger. Ha ha! All right, chapter 12. Adieu. The sound of the drum changed again. The final tap disappeared, and it became nothing but boom. Boom, boom, boom. Lester used only his tail, bringing it down with great force and seriousness upon the drum. The Threadmaster retreated from Despero. The room full of mice fell silent, expectant, and waiting. And as Despero stood before them with the red thread round his neck and fourteen members of the mouse council perched on bricks above him, the two burly mice came forward. Black pieces of cloth covered their heads, and there were slits for their eyes. We, said the bigger of the two mice, will escort you to the dungeon. Despero, Antoinette called out. Oh, my Despero! Despero looked out into the crowd of mice and saw his mother. She was easy to spot. In honor of her youngest mouse being sent to the dungeon, she had put on a tremendous amount of makeup. Each of the hooded mice put a paw on Despero's shoulder. It's time, said the one on the left, the first hood. Antoinette pushed her way through the crowd. He is my son, she said. I want to have a last world with my son. Despero looked at his mother. He concentrated on standing before her without shaking. He concentrated on not being a disappointment. Please, said Antoinette. What will happen to him? What will happen to my baby? Ma'am, said the first hood. His voice was deep and slow. You don't want to know. I want to know. I want to know. He is my child, the child of my heart, the last of my babies. The hooded mouse said nothing. Tell me, said Antoinette. The rats, said the first. The rats, said the second. Yes, yes, we, oui, the rats, what of them? The rats will eat him, said the second hood. <gasps> said Antoinette. Mon dieu! At the thought of being eaten by rats, Despero forgot about being brave. Wouldn't we all? He forgot about not being a disappointment. He felt himself heading into another faint. But his mother, who had an excellent sense of dramatic timing, beat him to it. <laughs> of course she did. She executed a beautiful, flawless swoon, landing right at Despero's feet. Well, now you've done it, said the first hood. It doesn't matter, said the second. Step over her. We have a job to do. Nobody's mother is going to stop us. To the dungeon. To the dungeon, repeated the first hood, but his voice, so deep and certain a moment ago, now shook a tiny bit. He put a paw on Despero and tugged him forward, and the two hoods in Despero stepped over Antoinette. The crowd parted. The mice began to chant, To the dungeon, to the dungeon, to the dungeon, and the drumbeat continued. Boom, boom, boom. And Despero was led away. At the last moment, Antoinette came out of her faint and shouted one word to her child. That word, reader, was adieu. Do you know the definition of adieu? Don't bother with your dictionary. Well, because it's French. I will tell you. Adieu is the French word for farewell. Farewell is not the word you would like to hear from your mother if you were being led away to the dungeon by two oversized mice in black hoods. Words you would like to hear are, take me instead. I'll go to the dungeon in my son's place. 
There's a great deal of comfort in those words. But, reader, there is no comfort in the word farewell, even if you say it in French. Farewell is a word that, in any language, is full of sorrow. It is a word that promises absolutely nothing. And that is where we stop. Okay, so this was eight, chapter 8 through 13. Or 12, sorry, we're at 13. Uh, 8 through 13. Uh, uh, 8 through 12. This was 8 through 12, and we stopped at 13. I will keep uploading probably twice a week, maybe more, depending on how bored I get. That depends on if I read through all my books first, though. Uh, so anyways, I'll keep uploading at least two a week and keep moving through it. We're currently on page 67 of... How many are there? Uh, we're on 67 of 267. So, you know, getting close to a third of the way through. Hip, 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 hooray. All right, I hope you all have a wonderful day. And please don't drive your parents too crazy. I miss you all.